I played two Pokemon Nuzlocks at the exact same time. But what does that mean exactly? I have a game of Pearl and a game of Diamond running simultaneously, where my inputs are recorded in both games. I'll be playing through each game as a hardcore Nuzlocke, which has a strict rule set. Most importantly, if a Pokemon ever faints, I can never use it again. These rules make the game much more challenging. However, these games aren't operating independently. Oh no. These games are parallel universes. Each Pokemon I catch is directly tied to a Pokemon in the other game, and their fates are tied together too. So if one Pokemon faints, the other is considered fainted as well. This is often called a soul link, but I'm doing it by myself, so it's more of a soul link. But the connection between these games and these fated Pokemon doesn't stop there. Every decision I make in battle must be done simultaneously. Who I send out first must be the same. Switching out must be at the same time and to the same Pokemon. Even the move slot I select on the screen must be the same. As the randomness of Pokemon happens around me, I must make the best single choice across two different games. I'm not just playing two Nuzlocks at the same time. I'm playing a two-player Nuzlocke by myself. We begin by meeting our rivals and selecting our starter Pokemon. Because of Sinnoh's notorious lack of fire Pokemon, I select Chimchar. Since these Chimchars were caught in the same area, they are linked together. My rules require me to use the same move slot in both games, even though different things are happening in each game. Now that I've agreed to help Professor Rowan, the Nuzlocke can officially start. One of the key Nuzlocke rules is I can only catch the first Pokemon I find in each new area. I'll also be playing with Duplicates Claws, meaning I can't catch a Pokemon I already have. And this extends across games, so if one game already has a Pokemon, I can't catch it in the other. On Route 201, my first Pokemon in both games is a Bidoof, so the Bidoofs are linked together. On Route 202, I find two Starlies, so my first three Pokemon are all the same. When Pokemon are linked to the same species, I call this identical twins, but this isn't always the case. On Route 204, my first Pokemon are Budu and Shinx, so for the first time, my linked Pokemon aren't the same. These are fraternal twins. Fraternal twins make things much more complicated, because with identical twins, you can expect some level of consistency. You know what my favorite fraternal twins are? It's subscribing to the channel and leaving a comment on this video. Though structurally different, they're similar in that they help out my channel a ton. Let me know in the comments who your favorite twins are, whether it's your own twin in real life or a fictional set of twins. I'll be pinning the best comment to determine once and for all who is the Zygote. In the Orberg Gate, I'm able to catch Zubat Geodude Fraternal Twins, and in the Ravaged Path, I catch Psyduck Identical Twins. With the teams in place, let's take a look at the fight against Rourke, the first gym leader. Rourke sends out Geodude, and I must send out the same Pokemon in each game. So I start with Duck Duck. I have to select the same move in each game, and I've set up Water Gun to be in the same move slot. Both Duck Ducks outspeed and one-hit KO Geodude. Rourke sends out Onyx next, and I decide to stay in despite both Duck Ducks being slower. Both are safe though, and can retaliate with a water gun that knocks out Onyx. Things get much more complicated with the final Pokemon, Kranidos. Kranidos knows Pursuit, so the only safe time to switch out is now. I have to switch to the same Pokemon, so I go to Star Star. Star Star can lower Kranidos' attack, but I'm only using it as a pivot. The difference in the runs is evident here, as the right Star Star gets pursued, leaving me with a perfectly healthy Shinx on the right, but a damaged Budu at minus one defense on the left. Mega Drain and Bite are the highest damage moves, so I've put them in the first move slot. Both can take an attack from Kranidos, but Budu barely lives and flinches. Shinx also isn't doing that much damage. I'm dead to Pursuit, so I stay in to go for a Quick Claw proc, and I don't get it, but Kranidos goes for Leer, and after Luxorade is able to fully attack, my games are largely in the same place. Roar heals up so I can just attack again, and after surviving one more attack, Shinx isn't able to kill Kranidos, but Budu is. With the left fight done, I'm now free to do whatever I want in the right game. Freedom is a curse though, as I get Pursuited switching out, 
Luxoraid the Shinx is dead, which means Luxoraid the Badu is also dead. Geobat can finish the fight, but we have a very somber first badge. On Route 207, I catch identical twin Machops, and after making it to Floaroma Town, I catch fraternal twins Pachirisu and Buizel in the Valley Windworks. Self-Destruct is normally a great Hail Mary for Nuzlocks, but since my Geodude is linked to a Zubat, it's more like Self-Destruct with a little bit of murder, just for fun. This challenge creates interesting situations, like sometimes I'll be able to one-hit KO a Pokemon on one side, but not on the other, so now I still have to do the same thing in both games, but I'm up against two different Pokemon. Also, just because two linked Pokemon are identical twins, doesn't mean they're the freaking Winklevosses. They still have different natures, IVs, and even abilities. One Chop Champ is Guts, while the other is No Guard. So, against Commander Mars, when her Zubat poisons Chop Champ, the two different abilities lead to two completely different situations. On Route 205, I catch Shellos identical twins, and on Route 211, I catch Metatite identical twins. For my Eterna Forest encounter, I'm presented with an interesting choice. I already have Budu, so I have to catch the Cascoon on the left, but on the right, I can take the guaranteed fraternal twin in Silcoon, or leave it up to chance by catching the Wormpool. Cheryl's Chansey ends up making the choice for me though, and I end up with Dustock's Beautifly fraternal twins. In Eterna City, we can take on the second gym leader, Gardenia. Having linked fire Pokemon is a huge benefit here, as Infrachar can outspeed and one-hit KO Cherubi. Against the Turtwig, Flame Wheel is a range to kill, so I start with Taunt so it can't put up Reflect. I don't want to put Turtwig into Overgrow, so I start with a Mach Punch. This has the added benefit of making sure that the next Flame Wheel will kill, keeping my games consistent with each other. Finally, Gardenia sends out Roserade, whose attacks don't do much to either Infrachar, and Flame Wheel will be a two-hit KO in both games. I'm perfectly safe, so I stay in again, and with a second Flame Wheel, we defeat Gardenia on the same turn in both games. In the Old Chateau, I catch identical twin Ghastlies, and defeat Team Galactic shortly after. Prepare for trouble, make it double, am I right? On Route 206, I find a Stunky and a Ponyta, so I certainly have some interesting combinations of Pokemon. I have another rival fight in Heart Home City, and I don't have identical twin electric Pokemon to take on his Starly. Thankfully, Pachizel the Buizel can still take out Starly with Crunch. However, this causes the AI to send out two different Pokemon next. I send out Stunky Taw since they're both good defensive matchups, but I forgot to put good attacking moves in the same move slot. So while I kill Ponyta with Stomp on the left, I'm just using Smokescreen on the right. This sends out Prinplup on the left, and I still don't have any amazing options here. I send out Star Star, who can pluck his way to victory, but I need to be careful about who I'm manipulating the AI to send out. Next, I get the egg that turns into identical twin Happinis, and head north to Salacion Town. Close by in the Lost Tower, I find Misdreavus Murkrow Fraternal Twins. Very cool how this game has multiple spooky locations, but no new ghost types that live in them. Very cool. I always forget how tough this double battle is just before Veilstone. The Pokemon are really strong, including a Gyarados that you have to fight in the rain. Two of the slots in my party are occupied by fire Pokemon, but I do make it out with no deaths. Before heading in, I catch identical twin Kadabras, and now it's time to take on the Veilstone City Gym Leader, Maylene. I start by sending out Miscrow, who's holding a Mind Plate, as one of my rules is linked Pokemon must hold the same item. Wing Attack on the right can kill Metatite, but Psybeam is just a two-hit KO, so now I'm facing two different Pokemon. I can just do the same thing again, but the Metatite on the left goes for Detect, while the Machoke will die to one more hit. Machoke lowers Murkrow's defense, but on the next turn I can knock out both Pokemon. Although the games are still not consistent, I'm able to do some damage to both Pokemon, but the Lucario on the right does a lot of damage with Metal Claw, so now I need to switch. I switch into Gastgar for a bit, but I can't kill either before I need to switch out again. This time I go to Gastros, where Mud Bomb kills Machoke and does a lot of damage to Lucario. 
After all that, we finally have Lucario out in both games. That's great because I love consistency, but when both Gastros miss a Mud Bomb, that's not the consistency that I love. Finally, I switch to Chop Champ, who stands tall against Lucario's attacks and retaliates with a super beefed up Revenge, which one hit KOs Lucario from full health, and of course, takes out the damage Lucario as well. I learned an important lesson during this fight. Consistency between games is more important than raw power. However, sometimes consistency is just out of my hands. In this random trainer battle, I have the pleasure of being both mean looked and cursed. So I can't switch out and I'm slowly dying. My only chance is to kill the Pokemon and end the fight, but the trainer has three Pokemon and I run out of time. There's nothing I can do to save Gastgar. Immediately after this, I'm attempting to catch identical twin giraffe rigs, and the wild one gets a first turn wake up crit, taking out Abrakazam. I guess when it comes to psychic types, this tan ain't big enough for the two of us. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, sometimes my American comes on too strong. I make it to Pastoria where I catch identical twin Magikarps and Remoraids. Next up is Crasher Wake, who leads with a Gyarados that's four times weak to electric. However, my only electric type is Fraternal Twins with a Float Soul. Haunted by the complications of the Maylene fight, I don't think starting off with inconsistency is my best bet. However, this run has blessed me with a very unique opportunity. Gastros is strong defensively against Gyarados, and both my Gastrodons have the hidden power type Electric. This gives me the two-hit KO consistency that I'm looking for. However, things go immediately off the rails, as my Gastrodon on the right flinches from Bite, causing me to only kill the left Gyarados. As Wake sends out a different Pokemon, my previous words echo through my head. Consistency is more important than raw power, you stupid ass moron. So even though I know it will do nothing on the left side, I use Hidden Power Electric again, taking out the Gyarados and bringing my games back to the same place. Against Quagsire, I bring in Octoraid, who can take Quagsire's hits and has a diverse move pool. On the first turn of using Bullet Seed, I get 5 hits in both games, which is actually too good because it causes Wake to heal on the next turn. Then I get a different amount of hits on the next turn, bringing the inconsistency back. However, I'm safe to just stay in and Bullet Seed again. Now that both Floatzels are out, I can bring in Gyrocarp and click Dragon Rage until the fight is over. Consistency is king, getting us the fourth gym badge. Now that I have a lot of Pokemon, catching identical twins is easier. In the Great Marsh, I catch Barboach, and on Route 212, I catch Wooper. On the wonderful Fog Route, I have a few close calls, but everyone makes it through and I'm into Celestic Town. I catch up with my old pal Cyrus and head back to Heart Home City to take on the fifth gym leader, Fantina. Fantina's ghosts can be nerfed with normal type Pokemon, so by sending out Babaroof, all Driftblim can use is Gust and Minimize. Equipped with the Shell Bell to keep me healthy, I'll eventually win this 1v1. However, the left side Babaroof misses not one, not two, but three straight surfs. But after Fantina heals up on the right side, it's actually ahead. But then we're back to business as usual. Despite missing so many surfs, in the critical moments, it's the right side that misses. And the games are uneven as Fantina sends out Miss Magius. I'm expecting Magical Leaf, so I pivot through Star Star, but Miss Magius goes for Confuse Ray, using up my Person Berry at the worst possible time. Now I go into Giraffe Rig, and at least the pivot had minimal damage. I can kill Driftblim now, but the right side Fantina sends out Gengar next, so everything is just off. My plan was to switch in Blissey on Miss Magius, since it only knows special attacks, but with Gengar out, I just can't. Instead, I switch back to Star Star and click Fly until it takes out Miss Magius and then takes out Gengar, but now I just have to deal with the reverse. Eventually, I get to the point where one more fly should end the fight, but Star Star is confused, and a self-hit would be its demise. I don't really have any other Pokemon that can take them out. However, there's one thing I can think of to do. To reset the confusion, I go into Miscrow, and when I switch back in, I bait moves that don't do anything. Then I click Fly, and thankfully, both land, giving us a very sketchy fifth badge. 
In the trophy garden, I catch two identical twin Pichus. On Fuego Ironworks, I catch two Wingles. And on 218, I catch identical twin Tentacles. Entering Canalave City with a diverse set of Pokemon, I'm able to keep the rival battles more consistent, and get much easier victories. I help Riley out on Iron Island, and my encounter here is an Onyx and a Steelix. Since I can never evolve Onyx, I guess these are fraternal twins, but this is a weird gray area. I hatch the Ryolu egg, and take on the 6th gym leader, Bywin. I'm sorry, Byrin. <laughs> I always get it mixed up because all you have to do is click Flamethrower, Close Combat, and Flamethrower to beat him. Thanks for the free badge! I defeat the commanders at the lakefronts, and now it's time to trek up to Snowpoint City. On the way, I catch Sneasel Identical Twins and Snover Identical Twins. Next on the schedule is the seventh gym leader, Candace. Snover can be easily taken out with one flamethrower, and then Candace inexplicably sends out Obama Snow next. Infrachar easily takes it out as well. Third is Sneasel, and even though the one on the left is faster than me, I can still take it out with one close combat. The last Pokemon is Medicham, who doesn't know a psychic move, so Cruel Cool is a great tank. Unfortunately, on the right I get paralyzed from Force Palm, and then get fully paralyzed not once, but twice in a row. Now I have to switch, so I go to Wing of Her to stall it out for a bit. Finally, I have to risk a crit to go back to Infrachar and finish the fight. I had terrible RNG, but I had a really poor backup plan. Now I need to trek through and over Mount Coronet to get to Spear Pillar, where the showdown with Team Galactic is looming. Part of that showdown is a double battle with Barry against Mars and Jupiter. During this battle, on my game on the right, Infrachar gets double targeted with an air cutter and a poison jab. Infernape is one of the absolute worst Pokemon to lose. Because of this, I now have to fight Cyrus with only 5 Pokemon. This snowballs into losing Star Star, Whoop Sire, and Biberoof on the Cyrus fight. I make it out alive, but I'm down 3 really important Pokemon. I'm in Sunnyshore now, taking on the 8th and final gym leader. Volkner starts with Raichu, and I send out my slow Wizboach. The Raichu on the right puts up Light Screen, which doesn't prevent Wizboach from taking it out. However, it very much affects my plan to take out Octillery. I decide that I need to stall out Light Screen turns. On the anticipated Grass or Water moves, I switch to Giracarp, and when I expect Charge Beam, I switch back to Wizboach, although it doesn't always work as I plan. Finally, with one turn of light screen left, I switch in my own Raichu, who I named after my favorite type of train. With no light screen up, I can take out Octillery with one Thunderbolt. Next out is Luxray, so I switch to Onsteel to do a bit of damage, and then when I need to switch out, I pivot through Lucario to bait the Thunderfang, which at least works in the left side game. Both Wizboaches take out Luxray with Earthquake. Finally, Volkner sends out Ambipom. It's supposed to be used as a setup mon, with Nasty Plot, Agility, and Baton Pass. But since it's the last Pokemon, the only thing it can use is Shockwave. And since that can't affect Wizboach, I can stay in an Earthquake until I win the fight. I now have 16 badges across two Hardcore Nuzlocks. I can access Victory Road now, and I don't have any issues going through. In the rival fight, I have such a big level advantage that I just completely destroy him, which means it's time to take on the Elite Four. Or, well, I guess it's the Elite Eight. Regardless, it's time for the final run of the challenge. Let's find out if it's possible to defeat two Hardcore Nuzlocks at the same time. My mantra is still consistency over power, so against Eren and his bugs, I send out Lakaralu, who may seem like an odd choice against a lot of bug and flying Pokemon. However, Lucaralu is a great counter to Dustox specifically. The only way Dustox can deal damage is through Bug Buzz or Toxic. Lucario is a Steel type, so Toxic doesn't work, and it has a 4 times resistance to bug moves. Being a defensive wall gives Lucaralu the perfect opportunity to set up Sword Stance. The other moves Dustox can use are Light Screen and Double Team. I don't care about Light Screen since I'm raising my attack, but Double Team is actually a problem. If I miss in one of my games, I'll be against two different Pokemon, and even though I'll be at plus 6 attack, I still need to be strategic with which moves I use. After three sword stances, the Dustox on the left is at plus two evasiveness, and the one on the right didn't use double team. I go for an Iron Tail, and thankfully both connect, knocking out Dustox. 
Some of the Pokemon on Aaron's team are faster than me, but Lakaralu knows extreme speed, and I've given them a Silk Scarf to hold. That means that both Lakaralus can take out Heracross, Drapion, and Beautifly with extreme speed. The last thing I need to consider for this fight is extreme speed PP. There's only 5 total, and Vespaquin has the ability Pressure. I was planning to use Iron Tail, but since Aaron sends out Vespaquin last, I can use one final extreme speed to take it out and beat Aaron. Bertha claims to have a specialization in ground type Pokemon, but like most boss battles in this game, this isn't consistent across her whole team. The thing that really connects her team is a weakness to grass type moves. However, my only relevant grass types either are too slow to make any noise, or died several, several gyms ago. With that possibility out of the way, I need to come up with a new plan. The thing scaring me the most is Bertha's first Pokemon, Quagsire. But not because it's strong, I have many team members who can one-hit KO it. I'm scared of the move Protect. In a normal Nuzlocke, Protect just wastes a turn. But in this double Nuzlocke, Protect threatens the consistency I crave so dearly. If one side uses Protect and the other doesn't, my games will be out of sync. So what can I do to navigate around that? Well, here's my plan. I haven't used Duck Duck much since the early game. It isn't strong enough, fast enough, or diverse enough to be very useful. But here, it's absolutely perfect. I start with the Surf, and just as I feared, the Quagsire on the left goes for Protect, but the one on the right doesn't. So now I'm against two different Pokemon, but that's okay, because with Duck Duck, all I need to do is click Surf until I win both games. Surf will one-hit KO some Pokemon, but not others, especially since the Duck Duck on the left has a much lower special attack. So why wouldn't I bring something that consistently one-hit KOs everything? Well, both Duck Ducks have the ability Cloud 9, which disregards all effects from weather. Many of Bertha's Pokemon can and will put up sand, so Cloud 9 removes the special defense buff of Rock Pokemon, allowing me to Oko them with Surf. Secondly, I'm not taking constant Sandstorm chip damage, so in the rare instances where I actually get attacked, I'm still extremely healthy. I can just click Surf, regardless of who I'm facing, and I'll know I can make it through the fight. The right side finishes first, and the left side finishes a few turns later. Bertha's are defeated. The first fight that will require real improvisation is Flint. Flint starts with his fast Rapidash, and I send out Duck Duck. The chaos begins immediately, as the left side Rapidash goes for Bounce, and the right side Rapidash puts up Sun. Duck Duck doesn't care about Sun though, as Cloud9 allows him to one-hit KO with Surf. I ran Protect on Duck Duck just so it could block Rapidash shenanigans, and since Infernape just has attacking moves, it's safe on that side too. I stay in and survive hits from both sides, since I can take out both the Rapidash and the Infernape with Surf. I'm safe to whatever is coming at me if I switch to Gastros, and after I survive another hit, I use a Choice Specs Boosted Surf to do some damage to Low Punny and one-hit KO Infernape. Thankfully, Gastrodon also baits Low Punny, so my games are even again. Low Punny can only deal damage with Fire Punch and Mirror Coat, so if I switch to a physical attacking water Pokemon, I'll be perfectly safe. I switch to Giracarp, and although I'm safe to use Dragon Dance here, Gyarados sweep content is cringe, so I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I slowly chip away Low Punny's damage with Ice Fang, waiting for the sunny day to wear off. When it finally does, I use Waterfall. I was hoping it would kill in both games, but unfortunately it doesn't. But the more I think about it, the more this situation is actually kinda perfect. On the left side, I have a low punny that's about to be healed to full health, and a healthy Gyarados at like minus four attack. No matter what move I use in this game, nothing will really change. So I can apply a strategy often used in double battles. By neutralizing one of the Pokemon in a double battle, and then letting it live, you can focus your attention on the other Pokemon, essentially giving you a 2v1. In a weird way, I can do the same thing here. The left side is neutralized, so I just make the best decision on the right side. I waterfall the Steelix to one-hit KO it, and then use an Ice Fang to get Drifblim under 50% health, and a second one to finish that fight. And basically nothing has happened on the left side. Since I can do whatever I want now, I switch around to reset Gyarados' stats, and then start working my way through Flint's team, just like on the right side. 
To avoid the aftermath damage, I bring in Weave Soul to kill Driftblim. And just like that, I've defeated Flint. Lucian is very tough, but fortunately, his first Pokemon, Mr. Mime, is not. Both Weave Souls outspeed and one hit KO Mr. Mime with Night Slash. Next out is Medicham, who sees kills on Weave Soul with both Drain Punch and Fire Punch. So I switch to Giracarp, who both gets an Intimidate off and easily takes either attack. Giracarp is a pivot, and I'm hoping to bait Thunder Punch so I can switch to Gastros. It doesn't work out, but Gastros is still pretty bulky. With the choice specs, Surf will be a two-hit KO on Medicham, but in a complete twist of events, this is healing range and this isn't, so I'm only able to kill one of the Medichams. Once again, making my games inconsistent. This would change the entire trajectory of the fight. With Gastros at half health, Alakazam sees a kill with Psychic or Energy Ball. Both of these options would have given me a safe switch into Weavesile, and then I would outspeed and kill with Night Slash. Clearly, with Metacham still out, and the threat of Drain Punch or Fire Punch still looming, that is not an option. The only safe thing I can do is switch to Giracarp, and I risk a crit on the right, to stay in and kill on the left. I pivot through Duck Duck to get to Weave Soul and take out the Girafferig and the Alakazam with Night Slash. Here's where the snowball of events comes tumbling down. The only Pokemon I can consistently counter Bronzong with is Gyarados, and Gyarados is almost dead. I try to do some damage with Duck Duck, but it's not enough. And since I have stronger water Pokemon for Cynthia, I decide to sack Duck Duck. I try to do damage with Lucarulu, but that doesn't work either. And Bronzong takes out Lucarulu. With Hyper Potions now used on Bronzong, I try to send out Giracarp, but an unlucky crit on the left side renders that impossible too. I bring in Stunkita to finish the fight, but with three deaths against Lucian, is beating Cynthia even possible? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, no, not even close. The Lucario is too fast and too strong, and it sweeps my entire team on the right side. It's absolutely gutting to come this far and fall short. I'm happy with the plan that I made for these fights, but in the end it wasn't meant to be. Beating two hardcore Nuzlocks at the same time is definitely possible, but unfortunately, it didn't happen here. If you enjoyed this content, I recommend you check out my other videos on screen now, including other hardcore Nuzlocke challenges and playing 12 games of Pokemon at the same time. Also, if you enjoyed this video, it would be amazing if you liked it, left a comment, or subscribe to the channel. It's completely free and it helps me out a ton. Thank you so much for watching.